Hello everybody, my long lost friends. It's been so long, but here we are. MP Vinyl 2021, episode seven. Better late than never, right? Sorry it's taken so long. I just, uh, no excuses. I just got lazy. The holidays came around and uh, just uh, took a break, but we have unfinished business here, don't we? So welcome back. Uh, <laughs> Almost a year later, and I'm still uh, in quarantine here in the house. Been out for a few sessions, uh, but for the most part, I'm still sitting here, here in my pajamas. <laughs> and uh, it's insane. But anyway, it's uh, January 2021, and um, here we are. So, uh, MP Vinyl, Episode 7. Um, let's see. As you know, I'll give you all disclaimers. Uh, basically, these are all my new reissued stuff. I have all of my original vinyl back there, hundreds if not thousands of the original releases from the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I also have box sets over there and CDs and, and uh, eight tracks. So if you're not seeing it here, chances are I still have it in some other form somewhere else in this room. I've also decided to sit for this episode. Uh, when I was on the bottom rack for, uh, I guess, episodes three and four, I was on the floor. So I got a nice comfy chair now. So... Anyway, um, I guess we're going to get into this. Um, this is rack seven out of eight, which is beginning with SL, which is Slayer, and it goes to TR. So we're really only covering S and T in this episode, but you'll see why uh, there's a lot of, um, well, two, two bands in particular, there's large chunks of, uh, so we'll You'll see why we're, we're covering so few letters with one whole episode, but let's get into it, okay? Lost time. Sorry to keep you guys waiting for a new episode, and I uh, hope you're all doing well. Let's dive in. So we're starting with Slayer, and as I mentioned, I have all the original vinyl back there. I have the original Show No Mercy and Hello Eights, but this was one when I had to buy reissues. Uh, well, this is, in my, in my opinion, their masterpiece, Rain and Blood, 1986. Uh, I think the whole album is like 28 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, just absolute perfection from start to finish. One of those albums where, uh, well, as far as a metal album go goes, it's just completely relentless from start to finish. Uh, but it's such a compact uh, start to finish listen and pure perfection. As far as I'm concerned, the Holy Trinity is Rain and Blood and the two that followed, which were also South of Heaven season and Seasons in the Abyss. Neither of which I have on reissued vinyl, so actually I really should probably pick that up. So my only Slayer, uh, new Slayer reissued is, reissues are Rain and Blood, the classic, and then their last album, uh, uh, Repentless, which was the last album they did, um, Gary Holt in the band, I guess it was the only album they did with Gary, uh, you know, in the band, and Paul Bostoff on drums. So this was the lineup they finished up with, and uh, I can't believe, it's crazy to say that, uh, you know, they're done, but uh, yeah, as of now, this will be the last Slayer album. Doesn't look likely they'll do any more, but of course, whoever knows. But in any case, Slayer, one of the greatest metal bands of all time, part of the Big Four, the most uh, brutal of the Big Four. You know, just they they just really were always the uh, the benchmark for for speed and uh, brutality, and you know, Dave Lombardo's drumming on all those early albums it was such a huge influence for me for uh, double bass drumming. And of course, now he plays with Mr. Bungle and uh, uh, Misfits and Suicidal. He, you know, he's just one of those drummers that's done so much great stuff and has so many great gigs. Love the guy, love the band, and long live Slayer. All right, next in the SL department, this is a, this is a modern day stoner classic. This was uh, Sleep's uh, come, I guess, come, I don't want to say comeback album, but like reunion album or whatever it was. This was the first album they put out in like 20 years or so. They put it out, like, I think it was last year or 2019. Uh, 2018, wow, time is flying. This was one of my favorite albums of that particular year. But this was after a 20-year hiatus they came out with this. If you don't know Sleep, they are the kings of stoner rock or stoner metal. Um, full on, you know right out of the Sabbath, uh, you know, riff book. And uh, the sleep, well, they, they had a previous album, uh, which was one long 60 minute song. So, you know, kind of prog in that respect, but not really prog in terms of playing. I mean, it's very, it could have, 
it occasionally goes through real periods of just noise and and feedback and uh you know sludgy riffs you know but uh if you're into stoner metal and stuff like this i mean they are they were one of the kings and this was a great great comeback album love this album this was the sciences uh from a couple of years ago now we're about to hit a big chunk uh of the same band and it's one of my bands and the reason there's a big chunk if you saw previous episodes you know that i collect all the different color if it's colored vinyl i'll collect all the different colors of all of my bands so you, you saw this with uh you know with dream theater and uh flying colors you know a bunch of my other bands neil morris band where there's just multiple copies of the same album in this case there's really only two albums but there's a pile of about 20 uh well maybe 10 or 20 vinyls here so it's sons of apollo this was our first album psychotic symphony and might as well just pull them both out see so them side by side um psychotic symphony and uh, 2020 MMXX. Let's talk about one at a time. This was uh, Psy Psychotic Symphony came out in, uh, there you can see the Roman numerals, so it was 2017. And, uh, you know, pretty much all of my 2018 was spent on the road with, with them. And this was one of my latest, uh, you know, super groups. And just what a lineup. You know, myself, Derek Sherinian, Bumblefoot, Jeff Scott Soto, Billy Sheehan. I mean, you know, you've, you've heard it, I'm sure. But really, what a lineup! What a what a band! Uh, every guy is just like a, you know a force within their their own world. And you put us together on stage; it's a five ring circus. This was the first album, Psychotic Symphony. Uh, some great stuff on here. Opus Maximus, the final instrumental, to, to me is one of uh, I think one of the the greatest instrumentals I've ever been a part of. Uh, you know, I think it's just one of those amazing instrumentals. Just so strong and so much, uh, you know, complexity to it. But uh, yeah, and then uh, we went on the road in 2018. We also have a live album that came out from 2018, which was the live with the uh, Plavdiv Symp uh, Psychotic Symphony Orchestra. And that was, uh, you know, we played with an orchestra and a choir. We did all these covers, covers from Aerosmith and Pink Floyd and Zeppelin and Rainbow and Ozzy and Van Halen. We don't have that on vinyl. We haven't put that on vinyl. I'm gonna to have to get with Inside Out. Inside Out, we gotta put that out on vinyl. That's missing from my collection, but that's definitely part of uh, the, the Sons of Apollo collection that you need to have. In any case, um, I have all the different colors here. I got silver, white, um, what is it, clear. So that's the first one. Here's the, the latest one, MMXX. And talk about unfinished business. Uh, this came out at the beginning of last year, about a year ago now, and we hit the road and sure enough, as fate would have it within a few weeks, you know, only a handful of shows we got over, we did a short American tour, got over to Europe and uh, COVID-19 hit and the rest is history. We've been home ever since. So we still have unfinished business with this album. We, have, we had a whole European tour that got postponed, the South American tour that got postponed. We probably would have gone through America again, but obviously all of that now um, in the history books. So we only got to do a handful of uh, maybe a couple dozen shows for this album. And it was going so great. We really felt such great momentum and excitement with it. Uh, so yeah, this was, <laughs> this kicked off 2020 and, uh, you know, within, uh, two months or so, you know, we figured naming the album after a new decade would have been really inspiring and fresh and exciting. It turned out to be that we're naming an album after the worst year in history. <laughs> so anyway, hopefully we will have an MMXX1 tour or MMXX2 tour to make up for, uh, you know, the, the unfinished business we have. So fingers crossed that that happens and we'll... We'll see. Time will tell. But what a great album. This was, uh, you know, uh, Goodbye Divinity was a, such a hugely successful first single. Uh, Asphyxiation is so heavy. King of Delusion is a favorite of mine, kind of a mini epic. New World Today was the big epic on the album, big 15-minute song with a little bit of everything. Anyway, great, great album. Um, hopefully we'll get to finish this tour someday. And back here we have the same album, but in clear, in white, in silver. Transparent blue, transparent magenta, light blue. Wow, we put out a lot of these. This one's a uh, purple, blue, black splatter that we sold on tour. So lots of variations on that if you're a collector. I even have all those colored ones seals, sealed. So uh, I, I haven't even seen them. There you go. So Sons of Apollo. Next up, this is um, Sound of Contact. This is a, a prog band 
that came out on Inside Out a few years ago, many years ago, actually. I guess what's the year on this? Hard to see. But it was around 2015-ish or so, I think. Doing that off the top of my head. But anyway, uh, Simon Collins on drums, uh, Phil Collins' son. Dave Curtin on keyboards, who's a great, great uh, player and writer, and kind of a, a great figure in the prog world. This was a great, great album, and uh, it kind of kind of self-imploded. I'm not sure the, the details behind what happened, but they ended up kind of uh, breaking up and not making any more music or touring or anything. But this was a great, great album for its time, and uh, I highly recommend it. If you're into the kind of proggy inside out stuff, this is a this is a good one. Speaking of the proggy inside out stuff, okay, we got a big chunk here, uh, a giant chunk. <laughs> I'm just gonna pull the whole. Well, you know what? I'll leave the chunk in there. But we're about to go to Spock's beard, Spock's beard land, and this is the one that started it all. This is the light, one of my favorite albums of all time. Surely one of my favorite. Prague albums of all time, uh, but surely one of my favorite albums of, of anybody's of all time. And this was how we all were introduced to Neil Morse. Uh, this came out, I think, in 95. Uh, was it 1995? Yeah. I got turned on to this album. Um, Dream Theater's manager at the time, Jim Petolsky, somehow got turned on to this album. And I can't remember if he gave me the CD or the cassette. Uh, it had just come out, and I fell in love with it. And I was blown away, first of all, because uh, around 95, all the prog bands that were coming around, the modern prog bands, they all sounded like dream theater to me, which wasn't very appealing to me. I wanted to hear something more unique, something different from what I was doing. And this was something new in the modern prog world, but it was a whole from a whole different background. It was more of a, you know, based in classic prog you know when i heard this album i heard yes i heard genesis heard the beatles pink floyd all of my favorite bands crimson they were all wrapped up in this and they were all great musicians all the players were great and uh most of all the songwriting was just so melodic neil morse's songwriting and his voice just really the hooks just got right into me and haven't let go now for you know 25 years um but this was the big one. It's only four songs. The Light, which is 15 minutes. Go the Way You Go, which is 12 minutes. The Water, which is 23. And then closing with On the Edge. To me, a perfect, perfect prog album. An all-time classic. And our introduction to Neil. And obviously, this was uh, you know a, a relationship that he and I would eventually fall into, which we'll, uh, you know, here we are 25 years later and 25 albums later. Uh, our, our history goes really deep now with everything Neil and I have done together, but this is where it began. If this album hadn't come out, if I hadn't heard this album, uh, both of our lives would be very, very different right now. And uh, carrying on, this was um, be their second album, Beware of Darkness. Also love, love, love this album. Uh, every song on here is a favorite and a classic. Beware of Darkness, the title track is actually uh, a cover uh, written by George Harrison uh, but their version is kind of like the Leon Russell version, kind of the way that, uh, you know, Yes did reinterpretations of songs. Well, Leon Russell did a reinterpretation of Beware of Darkness, and that's kind of uh, the kind of direction of the Spock's Beard version. But uh, anyway, Thoughts is a classic. The Doorway is a classic. Classic Walking on the Wind, Time Has Come. Every song on here is another favorite of mine. And when this came out, I got set, at, after the light came out, I reached out to both Neil and Nick DiVirgilio, became friends with both of those guys. So I remember before this came out, one of them sent me a cassette of the whole album. And I was doing a drum clinic tour in Europe in around 96. And all I had was the cassette of this, I, the cassette of this and Alanis Morissette's Jagged Little, uh, it was a Jagged Little Pill. And all I listened to on that drum clinic tour, because we were driving around, was these two albums. So I must have listened to this album about 30 times on that tour and just fell in love with it. And uh, anyway, uh, continuing with Spock's Beard, the third album, The Kindness of Strangers. I kind of put the first two in the same boat, and then I put the third and the fourth in the same boat. Kindness of Strangers and Day for Night. These two albums, for some reason, uh, I love them, but I didn't love them as much as the first two. Uh, but still was an avid cheerleader for the band, always talking about them in interviews, and then even took them out on tour uh, for this album. They were uh, promoting Day for Night, and Dream Theater was promoting uh, Scenes from Memory, 
and I brought them out, handpicked them as our support band for some select shows in America and in the full European tour. So if you saw us in 2000, uh, you saw Spox with us. And, uh, and from there, they went on to make uh, Five, which is uh, also one of my favorites. And uh, I put this up, I hold this as high as the first two albums in my book. I love, at the end of the day, the 16 minute opener is classic. And uh, The Great Nothing, the 27-minute epic closer, is also a classic. But everything in between, Revelation, Thoughts Part 2, All on a Sunday, Goodbye to Yesterday, it's a classic, classic album. Uh, and they put this out, I think, right after they finished the Dream Theater tour. And right around this time is when I started working with Neil. Uh, actually, I think Neil and I had already done the first Transatlantic album uh, before they toured with Dream Theater. So this came out around the same time as the first two Transatlantic albums. And then that led to Spock's last album with Neil, which is the classic double concept album, Snow, which came out uh, after Neil had already left the band. Neil announced, they announced this album, uh, and then Neil announced he was leaving Spock's as, as well as Transatlantic at the time. But they put out this double concept album, which when it came out for me, uh, probably surpassed all the first two albums and became my favorite Spox album. Uh, now, now I hold this one and the first two kind of side by side, but really this was Neil's first double concept album. And since then, he's done Testimony. Uh, we did uh, Similitude. We did The Great Adventure. Um, we did Transatlantic's latest double album. So, But this was the first. This was Neil's first in a long line of double concept albums. And at that point, when this came out, you know, I held this up, you know, side by side with Pink Floyd's The Wall or, uh, you know, Quadrophenia or, or Tommy. You know, it was just such an epic mammoth undertaking, a double concept album. And I think it's still one of Neil's greatest. Now we move into the post-Neil era. And, um, well, first, the, I guess I'm missing all of the Nick DiVigilio-led albums because the next here in my vinyl collection are uh, the ones that were led by t when Ted Leonard was leading the band. So this was their last two albums with Ted uh, up front. And this is uh, the brief, brief uh, no turns, Nocturnes and Darkness Sleep. I can't read, my, my eyesight is going. And The Oblivion Particle. These are their last two albums. And uh, Ted Leonard leading the band, Jimmy Keegan on drums, Rio and, and Dave and Al are still there. But Spock's Beard is one of those bands that was quality in every lineup. You know, they're all a little different from each other, kind of like Genesis, the, the evolution of Genesis, very similar, but always, always quality stuff. And, and Ted uh, ended up becoming a, tour man, uh, a touring member with Transatlantic and just such an all-around talent. Everybody in the band's an all-around talent. And then the last in the Spock's Beard section is Snow Live. And this was um, a couple of years ago at Morse Fest. Uh, there was one year I was unavailable, so uh, Neil decided to reunite Spock's Beard and finally, um, talk about unfinished business once again, finally uh, play this live. And I did it at Morse Fest. I think they also did a performance in Europe as well. And finally, they got to perform this legendary album with really the ultimate lineup, which was, you know, the original lineup as well as uh, Ted Leonard and Jimmy Keegan. So this was kind of like the big ultimate uh, Mommy Wami lineup uh, of, of all the lineups finally doing the Snow album. Great, 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 amazing album. Love the album uh, and the live version is even cooler just because of all the switching instruments and the different vocals and stuff like that. So really amazing. So there you go. That's Spock's Beard. Moving on to a classic, classic album. Chris Squire's Fish Out of Water. And this is a box set. This is like, a, I guess, a some sort of 40th anniversary or 45th anniversary box set. Uh, it's got new stereo mixes, the original mixes. It's got 5.1 mixes, different uh, different DVD content, seven inch singles. Really such a cool package, but what a great album. This was the classic Chris Squire um, solo album, Bill Bruford on drums. And uh, I put together a Chris Squire um, uh I guess, memorial concert, I guess, on Cruise to the Edge, the year that he passed away. And one of the things we did at that show is we played side one of this in its entirety. Uh, it was me and the Neil Morse band, and then we had uh, Pete Travis join us, and uh, Steve Hogarth singing some of it, and uh, 
uh, Jonas Rheingold on bass for some of it. And we did the whole first side, which is Hold Out Your Hand, You By My Side, and Silently Falling. All three such beautiful pieces of music. Uh, it was really awesome to be able to perform those songs live and pay tribute to uh, one of the great, great bass players of all time, Chris Squire. Uh, Fish Out of Water, obviously, uh, you know, Fish was his nickname. So, yeah, this was an amazing solo album. If you don't know it, definitely check it out. Classic, classic prog. And we go from classic prog to modern metal. This is Stone Sour. Uh, Corey Taylor, uh, Corey Taylor's side band uh, from Slipknot, I'm sure most of you know, my buddy Roy Mayorga on drums, Josh Rain on guitar. In any case, this is a live album that they put out recently. And uh, as some of you may know, I have a little history with them. Did a lot of touring with them when I was with Avenged. Uh, we toured together pretty much most of that year. Uh, but then I even sat in with them for a gig at Rock in Rio in 2011 when Roy's wife was giving birth to their baby. Uh, so yeah, you know, I got to sit in and play probably one of the biggest gigs of my life. It was, I think, 100,000 people there, viewed by millions of people online, so no pressure there. <laughs> Learning a whole set for a one-time, one-off show, but it was a lot of fun to play with them, and great band, great guys. And uh, there you go, that's the latest live album. Uh, here is one from The Sword. If you don't know, talking about stoner metal earlier, uh, The Sword are kind of like stoner metal, very much... Uh, you know, kind of like old Sabbath, but I don't think they're as stonery as Sleep. I think they're a little bit more Sabbathy, more in the, the vein of like C.O.C. or uh, Down, maybe. But yeah, great, great band in that vein. This is one of their latest albums uh, from a few years ago. Uh oh, records are flipping here. Hang on. Okay, now we come to another uh, couple in a row from some good friends of mine, Symphony X. And here we have, uh, well, this is an early one, The Damnation Game. Is this, this might have even been before Russell. You know what? I'm not sure offhand, or maybe this is, well, let's, you know what? Let's get this right. Is this with Russell or before him? No, this is with Russell, but this must be one of his first, if not his first album. Uh, this was a little bit before my time. I really discovered them with their five album, which I think came out the same time as Spock's Beard's Five. Uh, and the cover was almost identical as well, which was strange. But then this was the one that really won me over, The Odyssey. And this was the album that they were touring on when uh, I took them out with Dream Theater around 2007, 2008. Uh, this was when I really discovered how amazing they are. And, um, you know, Russell Allen's voice is just one of the best in the business. He's one of, one of the greatest out there. And um, Michael Romeo, obviously, is incredible. The whole band is incredible. And these two albums, I think, are two of their last two, Paradise Lost and The Odyssey. I love both of these, and I think they were really hitting their stride. You know, the Dream Theater tour they did with us, and then the follow-up with this, they were really doing well and getting a lot of momentum. But they just, you know, they kind of work slower, slower paced than a lot of bands, so they, you know, they don't really... They never really got the level to the level of Dream Theater, but they surely deserve it. I mean, the playing and the writing is just such top notch. And once again, Russell Allen is just, you know, it was just amazing to finally work with him with Adrenal Mob, even though that was in a much different kind of genre and direction. Uh, the fact that we were working together was something that, that I know a lot of fans wanted, but surely both he and I wanted as well. And uh, anyway, he remains one of my favorites to this day and also one of my best buddies as well. Uh, from Symphony X, it's hard to do this while sitting, we move on to Testament, and this is one of the latest Testaments. I have all the Testament stuff uh, from the original 80s vinyls all the way, to, you know, and MP3s of CDs of all the latest stuff, uh, but they've been through so many changes. Obviously, um, I work a lot with Alex, Alex Skolnick, as well as Chuck Billy in Metal Allegiance, so we've done a lot through the years. But their latest lineup, I mean, they've been through a lot of lineups through the years, but their latest lineup with, with Gene on drums and, and Steve on bass, um, yeah, it's really, what, what a lineup. But they have, they've had so many great lineups. I also really loved uh, the album they did with Dave Lombardo on drums. Uh, what was that called again? Was it the, uh, I don't remember offhand, but that was, I got to get that on vinyl. That's one of my favorites. And also they had an album, I think, called Low when uh, uh, John Tempesta was playing with them as well. Uh, with, I think James Murphy was on guitar around that period. But no matter where you drop in the Testament catalog, it's quality stuff. They are one of those bands like Slayer or Iron Maiden or whatever, where it's, it's consistent. You know what you're getting, and 
they always have the riffs. I mean, the riffs are always great. Alex is always playing his ass off. Uh, the drumming is always great, whether it's Gene or, or, or Lombardo or, or Tempest. I mean, you know, it's always great, always quality. So no matter where you land, you're going to get a good one. Uh, next one here is another strange album, Them Crooked Vultures. This was a side project with uh, Josh Hom Homie from uh, uh, Queens of the Stone Age, as well as Dave Grohl playing drums and John Paul Jones on bass. And this was really cool. I loved how experimental it was. They, they did this, I think, on the heels of uh, the Queens of the Stone Age album that, that Dave played drums on. I think it was not too long after that that they came out with this. So I loved seeing them continue to work together and then bringing in John Paul Jones and doing really experimental stuff. It was very much like, reminded me of like modern day cream or something like that. My only, the only thing that bummed me out is that Josh sang everything. And not that there's anything wrong with that because Josh is so cool. He's such a cool singer. But it, I thought it would have been really cool for him and, and Dave to have been swapping the vocals and sharing the vocals. Just would have taken this to another level in terms of creativity. But uh, that's my only minor complaint. Otherwise, it was a really cool project. They haven't done anything else, so as of this moment, it's kind of like a one-time thing, but it would be really cool to get something else from them. Uh, another ex experimental album, and strangely enough, my only Tool vinyl. Uh, this is, I think this is the Lateris album, uh, but honestly, I really should have all of theirs, because even, uh, mainly beginning with the Anima album, I think that was around 96, Everything they put out, the Anima album, then this, then the 100,000 Days, and then even their, their latest one. You know, those four albums took about 25 years to get those four albums out, but every one of them is such quality, such depth and, and deep. I mean, the rhythms and the odd time signatures and the, the patterns, and it's so intricately interwoven. It's no wonder they take so long to put out albums because the, the, the quality on each one is just so, so deep. Uh, so, yeah, I can't say enough great things about Tool. I love them. Danny Carey's an amazing drummer, uh, one of my favorite guys out there today. Uh, and uh, in any case, this is one of those, uh, all of those albums, which, all of those albums which are all equally incredible. Uh, so I need to get up my game and get those other ones on vinyl as well. Uh, okay, we are approaching the end here. There's two bands left. Uh, this is the other DT. Uh, Devin Townsend, and this is the only one of his I have on vinyl, but as far as I'm concerned, this is the one. This was his last album he put out about two years ago, and this is an utter, complete masterpiece from start to finish. There's Devin. Uh, man, oh man, I've, I love this album. It was not only my favorite album of the year when it came out, which was 2019, but also one of my favorites of the decade. Um, he's got three different drummers on here. All three of them are incredible, and he splits them up depending on the style. And believe me, the styles on this album range from insane blast beat death metal to uh, crazy prog, uh, crazy avant-garde, like Mr. Bungle moments, then these kind of big, beautiful, anthemic, voc big metal anthemic sections, and then sections that sound like they're coming straight out of like a Disney Walt Disney film. So, I mean, the, the, the range on this album is ridiculous. The playing on it is incredible. Devin's production is incredible. Also co-written with Mike Keneally, who's such an amazing talent. I can't say enough great things about this album. Everything about it is perfect. The only thing I could say that makes this album even better is get the 5.1 mix with the visualizer. It's mind-blowing. Absolutely mind-blowing. If you look at my Instagram stories, I have one of the one of the stories um, that's pinned to the top is me kind of doing a watch along with the Empath um, Visualizer in 5.1, and it's incredible. Can't, can't uh, recommend this enough. And finally, we are closing with, well, let me get, let me pull all these out here. We have the whole Transatlantic collection here. Um, I guess I'll start with, with the beginnings, with this kind of Transatlantic is kind of in three chapters, really. The first chapter was the first two albums. So we started with Simpty, uh, S M P T E. And Simpty, for those of you that don't know, it happens to be our initials, but it's also a term that's used in music for syncing up uh, tape and music and things like that. So it just seemed like a clever title. But this was our first album. We got together in 99, the summer of 99. 
I had I was I think I was still working on scenes from memory or either that or just wrapped it up uh, but met up with these guys in the studio at Millbrook Studios where I had done the, the first two LTE albums and uh, Neil and I had become friends uh, just because I was such an admirer and a fan and you know we started talking to each other a lot and and uh, we had this idea of coming together to do something uh, and long story short it was supposed to have started with Jim Matheos on guitar that didn't work out uh, but ultimately uh, Pete Travis was on board I think from the beginning and then ultimately we called up Lena Stolt to join us and that is how Transatlantic was born and look at the pictures in here I mean look at how how young we are uh, my hair is so short at this point uh, this was right around 99 Pete's hair is short all of our hair is short we look so young and uh we got together, we didn't know what was gonna come of this, and we started writing all of the above immediately from some demos that Neil brought in, and then Royna brought in a demo uh, which turned into My New World. Uh, Neil also brought in Mystery Train, and We All Need Some Light, we worked on those, and then we finally closed with In Hell Twas an Eye, which was a Procol Harum song that I always wanted to cover. Never knew anybody that even knew it. Sure enough, Royna Stolt knew it, loved it, and uh, we dug into it. That was also the first time really where uh, we established all four of us singing lead vocals. In Hell Twas and I has all four of us singing and that kind of began the trademark which would become the transatlantic sound. This is, so recently um, Inside Out has released them all individually uh, in limited edition. I think they did this a uh, couple years ago. Uh, I think they're out of print, but I believe now with us re-signing with the new album, they're also gonna reissue them all over again. So even though if you can't find these now, I think they're coming uh, coming out again soon. This was the special edition box set, which they did for all four albums. All four of them on colored vinyl, which matches the colors of the album. So I b believe this one would be pink, but it also has all the bonus disc stuff. So in this album, we had some out studio outtakes. Um, after the success of the first album, we got together a year later in 2000 to make Bridge Across Forever. Uh, which at the time a lot of people really considered our best album of, of uh, well, uh, we only had two, but uh, this one really is a classic. I think we were really starting to uh, have feel out a great chemistry between the four of us at this point. Uh, Duel with the Devil, opening with, uh, you know, a, a 25 minute song, Duel with the Devil, closing with Stranger in Your Soul, which is a 30 minute song, uh, a little pop kind of uh, uh, medley with Sweet Charlotte Pike, which was kind of our kind of uh, mode our 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 uh, ode to side two of Abbey Road, kind of weaving together a bunch of smaller songs to make a bigger one. And then this is the bonus one with uh, our version of Shine on Your Crazy Diamond, which we all share the vocals on, and was a great great cover. So there you go. These are the first two, and then uh, as I mentioned earlier, telling the Spock's beard story, Neil uh, decided to leave Spock's and effectively leaving Transatlantic as well. In, uh, after we did our 2001 tour for Bridge. But then we reunited about well, eight years later, eight or nine years later, to make The Whirlwind, which, uh, well, then this kind of brings us to chapter two, because the way I consider the first two albums, chapter one, uh, the third and the fourth albums, uh, The Whirlwind and Kaleidoscope, kind of represent chapter two for me. And uh, once again, I'll show you the boxes. Um, once again, I think they're colored vinyl, so I, I would guess this would be orange, this would be green, both of which have, uh, well, I'll go one at a time. The Whirlwind was um, our kind of re reunion. Uh, we had a secret reunion, I think around 2009. Uh, didn't let anybody know what was happening, and then we suddenly dropped this, which was our first concept album. It's essentially one 79-minute song which we thought would be the most extreme we would ever get, but more, more on that later. Uh, but yeah, The Whirlwind is one giant 79 minute song, uh, kind of beginning the next chapter of Transatlantic. And it was just great reuniting. The bonus disc on this has uh, four uh, originals that didn't make the main album, Spinning, Lenny Johnson, For Such a Time, and Lending a Hand. Uh, you can kind of tell where they each came from. Spinning stemmed from Royna, uh, oh, Spinning and Lenny Johnson were both kind of Roynas. For Such a Time was Neil's and Lending a Hand was definitely Pete's. Uh, but we had three, uh, excuse me, four great covers on here. The Return, Return of the Giant Hogweed, which was a great, great Genesis cover we did. A Salty Dog uh, by Procol Harum, one of my favorite songs of all time. 
and I sang lead vocal on that, which was really an honor because it was really one of my, mine and my dad's favorite songs ever. And my dad passed away um, right around when we put this out. So he never got to hear the version of A Salty Dog with me singing, but that was definitely uh, in his honor. And then we also covered I Need You, which was a, 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 a mashup between the two different I Needs You, uh, one by the Beatles and one by America. And then finally, Soul Sacrifice by Santana, which has my only recorded studio drum solo ever. So there you go. The Whirlwind, uh, I think, was my favorite Transatlantic album up until the latest, and we're about to get to that in a moment. But uh, after The Whirlwind, a few years later, we made Kaleidoscope, and um, this was following the form of Bridge Across Forever, where you know we, we open with like a 25-minute song, end with a 30-minute song, have a few short ones in between, so it was kind of in the in the same, you know, kind of the same blueprint as Bridge, but great, great stuff in here. There's moments on Into the Blue that are, uh, I think, as good as anything that, that uh, Transatlantic has ever done. And then we did a bonus disc of 10 covers. Oh, no, no, excuse me. Eight, eight covers, my bad. And You and I by Yes, Can't Get It Out of My Head by ELO, Conquistador, once again, by Procol Harum, once again with me on lead vocal. So it was our third Procol Harum cover. Uh, Goodbye Yellowbrook Road by Elton John, Tin Soldier, uh, which was The Small Faces, Sylvia, which was Focus, Indiscipline by King Crimson, and Nights in White Satin by Moody Blues. So I think the bonus disc was, was just as cool as the main album, in this case, a must-have. Once again, this is the out-of-print, uh, this was limited to only a thousand copies, this box. But once again, look for new reissues from Transatlantic coming soon. And that brings us to... Da, da, da. The unveiling of, I haven't even opened these yet. These are hot off the presses. This is the latest Transatlantic albums. Not the latest album, but the latest albums. <laughs> and um, now I could say this is my favorite Transatlantic album. As much as I love The Whirlwind, I think we took the same idea as The Whirlwind in terms of having one giant concept piece. In the case of The Whirlwind, it was a 79-minute song. Well, in this case, we ended up writing a 90-ish min, 90 minute song. Uh, we First, we wrote Forevermore. And I guess I, this is a good time to explain this because I know a lot of people are very concerned, uh, confused by this. And this isn't out yet. At the time of this filming, this isn't out yet. So I guess this is a good time to explain it. We went to Sweden in uh, September 2019. We ended up leaving there with this version written and arranged, which was a, a it was going to be a two CD, 90 minute song split over two CDs. Um, by the time we began tracking it and Neil started to track his stuff, he started to think this was just too overwhelming. And he started suggesting, well, what if we skimmed it down to a single disc? And some of us were not so keen on the idea. We really thought it was perfect as a 90 minute song or piece. Uh, but Neil kind of just thought it might be better to have something that was a little easier to digest. We couldn't agree on which way to go, so I suggested, well, you know what? Why don't we do both? It's never been done before. So I had the crazy idea. Uh, we went to the label and said, hey, would you support this? It's going to cost twice as much money to print up twice as much many copies. It was going to mean uh, doing twice as many mixes with Rich, uh, twice as much work for us. I mean, so it was really twice as much of everything but it also means twice as much for you, the listener. So we ended up completing the, the double album version, Forevermore, and then this version, The Breath of Life, was kind of Neil's vision, where some of the songs of this came off, but we, he, we added a few more new songs that are only on this version. Plus, uh, the, the whole thing with this is, this is not a tr an edited down version of this. They're completely different. Uh, something like, well, the, the overtures are completely different, orchestrated different, mixed different. Uh, songs like Heart, Li Heart Like a Whirlwind, which is on here, and Reaching for the Sky are the same musically, but the mixes are different, the instrumentation is different. Even the lyrics and the vocals are different, and who sings them are different. So there's many, many differences between the bo both of them. It's, it's really two completely different journeys. Everybody always asks, uh, which one do I start with? It's up to you. Do you want to sit down and take it in like a 90-minute movie? Or do you want to have something that's a little bit easier to digest around the 60-minute mark? Uh, both of which are completely different. Both of which are totally satisfying in their own. Uh, so there you have it. Coming soon. Uh, these will be out in about two weeks. But I also have a huge 
<laughs> all of the extra colors back here. This is silver, light pink, transparent magenta, pink, uh, lilac, lilac? I don't even know what lilac is. Lilac? Lilac. And then here are the different versions of Forevermore. Transparent turquoise, transparent Coke bottle green, limited blue, transparent petrol green. And as if that wasn't enough, hold your seat, hold on. I should have been more prepared and had this over here with me. As if those two weren't enough, this is the ultimate edition. This is a box set with both vinyls. So really three vinyls, because really it's a three disc set when you think about it, as well as it's on uh, vinyl, five, five LPs, three CDs, and it's got a Blu-ray, which has a version that I oversaw, which combines both into one super extended kind of hundred minute piece. Uh, and that's got a 5.1 mix on it as well. And as, as well as a visualizer, essentially a movie that you could watch for the entire thing, which is absolutely incredible. Now, when we announced this, a lot of people bummed out because people were like, well, we want the, the Blu-ray and everything, and I'm not a vinyl collector. So it, <laughs> this doesn't apply to you because if you're watching this, you're a vinyl collector. But if you're not a vinyl collector and you really want to experience this, we made a limited amount of these. They're available on the Inside Out uh, site, I think, as well as Neil's Radiant site, Roy News website, and Pete's website. They uh, all offer this. It's basically a freestanding Blu-ray of the 5.1 mix with the visualizer film of the, the ultimate version, which is, was the 100-minute the version. So there you go. I'm, I, I'm actually going to watch this in the theater tonight. So being at the end, I'm actually going to get the hell out of here and go watch this now. So there you have it. <clears throat> Did I hit the 15 minute mark? Wow, these, are, they, these get longer and longer. Uh, that is episode seven. The next episode, the next final episode will be number eight. The first band here, I'm not even gonna tell you, begins with a T and obviously it goes to the end, which I assume will be probably usually Frank Zappa or Zebra is you, or the zombies. But in any case, it's T to Z will be the next and final episode. Hopefully it won't take as long to put it out. Um, and hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully you uh, learned something about some of the albums maybe you already know and have and love. Uh, maybe even better, maybe you heard about something here that you don't know about, and uh, this will introduce it to you. And uh, in any case, happy listening. Thank you for uh, being patient for this episode. Uh, happy New Year to you all. Hopefully we will be back to normal real soon, so continue to be safe, and, uh, and hopefully we'll see you soon. Okay, happy listening. See you soon. Bye.